B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Question 25. You hear a physician explaining the issues involved in treating lower back pain. Now read the question. Lower back pain is one of the crucial issues in the medical field leading to disability and it's growing alongside the aging population which are more rapid in low income and middle income countries where adequate resources to deal with this issue might not exist. Therefore the impacts are probably extreme in such regions. Most of the lower back pain issues are unrelated to particular identifiable spinal abnormalities and this announcement is an alert for action on the global issue of lower back pain. Typically, most of the clinical practice guidelines suggest similar approaches for the investigation and treatment of lower back pain. Their suggestions include the use of biopsychosocial strategy with initial non-pharmacological treatment, including the suggestion of self-management and resumption of exercises, normal activities, and psychological programs for those with continuous symptoms. Nevertheless, recommendations are mainly based on the trials exclusively from high-income countries, focusing mainly on treatments rather than its prevention. Therefore, there is a massive gap between evidence and the existing practice. Without the use of suggested first-line treatments and inappropriately high use of imaging, spinal injections, opioids, and surgery. Following similar strategies will never reduce back-related disability or its consequences in the longer run. The effective treatment will be those which align the evidence with practice, focus less on spinal abnormalities, and suggestions of activities including work participation. Although we have devised effective and promising solutions that require greater attention and intensive research to establish whether they are suitable for larger scale implementation. These potential solutions include the redesign of clinical pathways, focused strategies to implement best practice, integrated health, and occupational interventions to reduce disability with prevention strategies. Question 26. You hear a discussion about melasma and different types of melasma. Now read the question. Hello doctor. What is melasma and what are the types of melasma? Well, melasma is a common patchy brown, tan or blue-grey facial skin discoloration, normally seen in women during their reproductive period. It typically appears on the upper lips, upper cheeks, forehead and chin of women of 20 to 50 years of age. There are four types of pigmentation patterns are diagnosed in melasma. Epidermal, dermal, mixed and an unnamed type found in dark-complexioned individuals. The epidermal type is characterized by the presence of excess melanin in the superficial layers of skin. Dermal melasma is defined by the presence of melanophages throughout the dermis. The mixed type includes both the dermal and epidermal type. In the fourth type, excess melanocytes are present in the skin of dark-skinned individuals. Question 27 you hear a discussion between two doctors about VX and its effects. Now read the question. Hello doctor. What is VX and how is it obtained? VX is a man-made chemical warfare agent classified as a nerve agent, which are the most toxic and rapidly acting of the known chemical warfare agents, which are similar to pesticides called organophosphates. Symptoms will start appearing within a few seconds of exposure to the vapor form of VX, 
while the appearance of symptoms may take from a few minutes to 18 hours of exposure to liquid form of VX. Compared with a nerve agent called sarin, VX is much more toxic by entry through the skin and much more toxic by inhalation. Since VX is the least volatile nerve agent with the slowest evaporation level from liquid to vapor, it can be a long-term threat as well as a short-term threat. Question 28. You hear a nurse in the emergency department discussing the care of a patient with a doctor. Now read the question. So, who have we got here? This is Adam King. He was brought in with a dislocated shoulder. He has Marfan syndrome, so we've seen him before with this. Last time he was here, the shoulder popped back in while we were putting his arm in a sling, and he was able to put it back in himself just by relaxing his muscles, but he's in quite a bit of pain right now, so he's having trouble calming down and getting those muscles relaxed. Right, I see. So, do you want to start with some nitrous and some pain relief? Yes, I think that's best. Just until he calms down. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about the cause of glioma. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is glioma, and what is the exact cause of glioma? Well, the exact cause of glioma is yet to be defined, although some hereditary disorders are known to increase the chances of developing these tumours. Examples of glioma include tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis. Depending on the specific type of cells involved, gliomas are categorised into different types. A pendymoma tumor arises from the ependymal cells that are found in the brain ventricles and spinal cord. Oligodendroglioma involves the cells called oligodendrocytes that provide insulation in the form of myelin. Astrocytoma tumor involves the astrocytes, which are the cells that transport nutrients and providing structural support to neurons. Mixed gliomas are the tumors that contain a combination of cell types, such as an oligoastrocytoma, for instance. Question 30. You hear a doctor explaining to his nurse about functional gastrointestinal disorders. Now read the question. Hello doctor. Can you explain to me about functional gastrointestinal disorders in patients? Well, functional gastrointestinal disorders is common in my daily clinical practice. This is characterised by difficulties in motility patterns and visceral hypersensitivity. If the patient is bloated and gassy, you should get them treated before the condition progresses. Bloating after meals, loose stool, constipation and gas are the minor symptoms of functional gastrointestinal disorder, while acid reflux, foul-smelling gas and abdominal distension are major symptoms of the disease. The symptoms such as foul-smelling sticky stool, hematochesia and the sense of urgency to defecate are the severe symptoms of the disease.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Professor John McNeil, who led a study on the impacts of aspirin. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. It's been estimated that around the world there are millions of people who are otherwise healthy, have never had a heart attack or stroke, are not at high risk of bowel cancer, yet who take aspirin on a daily basis, convinced that it's going to help them. Well, the evidence from the largest ever study in this area suggests not. A huge trial called ASPRI, involving healthy Australians and Americans aged over 70, given low-dose aspirin for five years, has found no benefits and some harms. The research was led by Professor John McNeil of the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University, who I spoke to before we went to air. Welcome to the Health Report, John. Thank you, Noam. It's pretty impressive. Three papers in the New England Journal. What sparked this study? Because it was Australian motivated, even though it occurred in the United States as well. I think we've been aware since the 1990s that there's an evidence gap that many millions of people take aspirin every morning and the evidence base, particularly for those who haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or have no other medical reason to be taking it, the evidence just isn't there. So what did you do in this study? We recruited 19,100 people from the United States and Australia. 16,700 were from Australia and we followed them for an average of 4.6 years and half of them took aspirin and half of them took placebo. And what were you looking for? What were your endpoints? Well, the endpoint here was disability-free survival, which is a measure of how long elderly people stay healthy. But how did you measure that? By measuring how long it took for people to remain healthy without having a permanent physical disability or developing dementia. And what did you find? Well, we found three things. Firstly, low-dose aspirin did not appear to increase survival. Disability-free survival or survival? Disability-free survival and survival. And it also didn't prevent heart attack or stroke. I think I should emphasise that this study was done in people who'd never had a heart attack or a stroke because people who have routinely take aspirin under very strong evidence to prevent them having another one. So we're talking about healthy people recruited who were over 70 on average, is that right? That's right. The average age was 74. What about cancer? A lot of people take aspirin to prevent cancer and there is some randomised trial evidence that aspirin can prevent cancer. Yes, this was a surprising finding in our study. There were numerically more people dying of cancer in the uh, aspirin arm than in the placebo arm. This was a, a relatively small effect. It wasn't statistically significant once we adjusted for the multiple comparisons that we were making, and it hasn't been seen in other large clinical trials. So we're suspending judgment as to what its significance really means. 
And what were the complications and the side effects? Well, we had the usual side effect of bleeding. We took a lot of care over the measurement of bleeding because older people are more inclined to bleed and aspirin enhances that effect. And we certainly had an increase in hemorrhage in the people taking aspirin. Now, previous studies have suggested, and we had this on the health report, I think it was last year, suggesting that if there was a hemorrhage risk, it was early on and that settled down later. We looked at this, but we couldn't find that. And according to our data, uh, the risk of hemorrhage just kept going. Now, we had a story not so long ago on the health report suggesting that the effect of aspirin, of low-dose aspirin, is actually only there in people who weigh 70 kilos or less. And that if you want to get an effect from aspirin, you should be on a higher dose, like 325 milligrams or even 600. We've had a brief look at that and we couldn't find that in our older people. What about dementia? Aspirin appeared to have no effect at all on dementia. But four years is not a long time to develop dementia. I mean, did you measure cognitive decline? Yes, we measured cognitive decline very carefully and we haven't analysed all the data yet, but certainly the number of people who were diagnosed with dementia was the same on each arm. But that raises a very important issue because we will be following the people who participated in a spree over the long term to see if there is a difference in incidence of dementia or cancer that appears later. And uh, we know that there's been evidence that cancer preventive effect does take four or five years before it becomes evident. That's one of the reasons why we've been very keen for our spree participants throughout both countries to continue to be involved and let us follow them up. Now, if you have hemorrhage or you have side effects like gastric upset or something like that from aspirin, the people who are taking the real thing might have dropped out more than people on the placebo. Did you, I mean, that could have affected the results? We did a lot of testing of how many people were taking aspirin. We counted their pill bottles and so on. And we found that basically there was very good compliance with the medication on both arms of the study. Could this be a phenomenon of as we are getting older we're actually not necessarily ageing, we're actually living longer, younger, and we're getting less heart disease. Was this population too young? Paradoxically, even though they were 75, were they actually too young to get an effect? Because 75 you know, is like the new 50, as they say. That's an interesting question. We followed people whose commencement average age was 74 and whose final average age was nearly 79. So that's following people through a reasonably long period. We had a number of people who were over 80 years of age. And as far as we could tell, there wasn't a really big difference between the impact of aspirin at any of these ages. So if somebody's taking aspirin now, they're entirely healthy, they've never had heart disease, they've not had bowel polyps, which is another reason why some people might take aspirin to prevent the polyps turning into cancer or new polyps emerging, and they're on aspirin, should they just stop? Look, we're not recommending this at this point. People taking aspirin take it for three reasons. I mean, some, of course, as you said, have had a heart attack or a stroke or something similar in the past, and they should definitely be on aspirin because the evidence is strong. And then there's others who've been put on aspirin by their doctors for a range of other reasons, and they should continue as well, certainly not stop without getting advice from their doctor. But then there's the third category who may have just decided, I've read somewhere, they're perfectly healthy, they think it's a good idea. The results of a, of a spree will lead these people to reconsider whether that's a good idea. Just finally, do we know the numbers of people who are taking aspirin unnecessarily? We know that it's much more common in the United States where... About 40 per day strong. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a physician giving a lecture on ankle fractures. 
You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. There are different types of ankle fractures and treatments vary significantly based on the location and severity of the injury. When a broken ankle occurs, the injury may be to the end of the medial malleolus, called tibia, or to the lateral malleolus, called or both. There are many types of ankle fractures, and let me explain you about certain common types of ankle fractures. Lateral malleolus fractures is the ankle fracture that involves only fibula. Most of the lateral malleolus fractures can be treated without surgery if the ankle joint remains stable. A surgery is recommended in case of an unstable joint or the ligaments are damaged. However, the hint for surgical recommendation is when the fibular fracture is within 4 cm of the end of the bone. In such case, the fracture can be treated non-surgically if there is no injury on the inner part of the ankle. Medial malleolus fractures involves only tibia. This fracture occurs to the bone on the end of the tibia, which is called the medial malleolus. An isolated medial malleolus fracture is very rare compared with an isolated lateral malleolus fracture. Generally, a displaced medial malleolus fracture is treated with surgery. Bimalleolar ankle fractures involves both fibula and tibia that occur when there is an injury to both the inner and the outer side of the ankle always resulting in an unstable ankle joint, and surgery is to be recommended for most of the patients with this kind of fracture. Even if the fracture heals without a perfect positioning, the ankle joint alignment will remain disturbed and could result in accelerated arthritis of the ankle. Even after a surgery, ankle cartilage can be damaged at the time of the fracture, resulting in arthritis. Therefore, a proper diagnosis and repair of these fractures is essential to avoid the chance of long-term problems. Although a bimalleolar equivalent fracture involves only fibula, there is also a tear of the ligaments on the inner side of the ankle resulting in instability of the ankle joint. Therefore, a surgery is essential. Trimalleolar fracture involves both fibula and tibia like a bimalleolar ankle fracture. However, the bone in the back of the tibia called the posterior malleolus is also fractured. At times, if a large fragment of bone is fractured, a surgery is inevitable. Posterior malleolus fracture involves only tibia. This is a rare injury in isolation. Fractures of the posterior malleolus generally occur in association with bimalleolar ankle fractures. In such case, the injury is called a trimalleolar ankle fracture. Maison nerve fracture involves both fibula and tibia, which is a less common injury. However, this injury needs to be diagnosed thoroughly, as there are chances of missing this injury. In this type of fracture, the bone is injured on the inner side of the ankle, called the medial malleolus. The force of this injury passes through the large ligament that connects the two bones of the leg, called the syndesmosis. Since the damage is caused to this supporting ligament, the ankle becomes unstable and most often a surgery is recommended. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.